Welcome to this neural network programming series. In this episode, we will learn how to use TensorBoard to visualize metrics of our CNN during the neural network training process. Without further ado, let's get started. At this point in the series, we've just finished running our network through the training process. Now we want to get more metrics about this process to better understand what's going on under the hood. To do this, we're going to learn how to use TensorBoard with PyTorch. In this episode, we'll cover the basics, and in the next episode, we'll see the true power of TensorBoard with how it allows us to rapidly experiment with the different hyperparameters. For now though, let's kick things off with the basics. TensorBoard is TensorFlow's visualization toolkit that was designed as a visualization tool for machine learning experimentation. As of PyTorch version 1.1.0, PyTorch has added a TensorBoard utility package that enables us to use TensorBoard with PyTorch. Since the PyTorch support for TensorBoard is very new and the steps for installation may change, check the blog post for this episode on deepblizzard.com for the TensorBoard install steps. Basically, as long as we have the correct versions of both TensorBoard and PyTorch, we're good to go. So let's briefly talk about what TensorBoard actually is, and then we'll see some code. TensorBoard is a front-end web interface that essentially reads data from a file and then displays it. It allows us to track and visualize metrics like our loss and our accuracy over time. It also allows us to visualize our network's graph and it allows us to view histograms of values like our weights, biases, and any other tensors that we can think of. To use TensorBoard, all we need to do is write the data we want TensorBoard to use to a file that TensorBoard can read. And to make this easy for us, PyTorch has created a utility class called Summary Writer. Before we look at the code, let's start TensorBoard and see what the interface looks like right out of the box. All right, the first thing we're gonna do before we run TensorBoard is just check the version that I'm running on my system. We check the version by calling TensorBoard and passing in the version flag. All right, so we can see that I'm running version 1.14.0 and this is the nightly build. To know whether or not you need to install the nightly build, check with the blog post for this video on deepblizzard.com where any version related updates will be posted. For now, let's run TensorBoard. To run TensorBoard, we just need to run the TensorBoard program and pass in the logdir parameter value. By default with PyTorch, data files are written into a runs folder that exists in the local directory. So we're gonna specify runs here. And we run TensorBoard, we just wait a few moments and we'll get a message back that tells us that TensorBoard version 1.14 is up and running at the host name of the machine, port 6006. So essentially, we have a server that is up and running and waiting for requests to come in on port 6006. In order to pull up TensorBoard, we just need to open our web browser and then browse to port 6006. And this is what TensorBoard looks like right out of the box with no data. And so what it's telling us here is that there are no dashboards because there basically is no data. And if we just go back to the terminal, I will we'll kill that session and I'll just show you that in my current directory, I have the runs folder. And if we list the items that are in that folder, we'll see that there's nothing there. But after we run our PyTorch code, we'll see that there are some directories that are getting written into the runs directory. And after we do this, TensorBoard will see the new data and it will consume it and display it to us. So let's jump over into the notebook and get some PyTorch code written so we can actually have some data to see inside our TensorBoard. All right, we're here in the notebook we've been working with throughout this series. Now, these are our standard imports that we need to pull in the Fashion MNIST data set and build a neural network with PyTorch and train it. Now, the only additional thing that we have here from what we've seen in the past is this new import statement at the bottom from torch.utils.tensorboard import summary writer. So this is the class that's gonna allow us to easily write out or send the data to the TensorBoard files. 
So let's go ahead and run this and get our imports. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is check our Torch and Torch Vision versions. You can see here that I'm running PyTorch version 1.1 and for Torch Vision, I'm running version 0.3. Now for PyTorch, 1.1 is the required version to have access to torch.utils.tensorboard. So make sure you update your version of PyTorch to at least 1.1. Now, if you run into any issues that you think are version related, be sure to check the blog post for this video on deepblizzard.com. That's where all the version related updates will be. Sad thing about the videos is that we can't update on that easily, but we can update the website. So just be sure to check there. All right, next, this is the function that we've been using to calculate the number of correct values given a prediction tensor and a label tensor. Next, we have our neural network. And this is just a convolutional neural network that has two conf layers, conf1, conf2, and then three linear layers, fc1, fc2, and the output layer. Those are defined as class attributes inside the class constructor. And then down in the forward method is where we actually make use of all of these layers. We pass a tensor in, it transforms its way through the network, and we return the transform tensor as output. Okay, next we're going to pull in our training set using the torch vision package. This is the fashion MNIST data set that we have access to through torchvision.datasets. Next, we're going to use this training set and create a data loader. So in this data loader, we're passing in the training set, we're specifying a batch size of 100, and we're also saying that we want the batches to be shuffled. And now we're set up, we're ready to train and use TensorBoard. So let's see exactly how we use TensorBoard, given a simple example, and then we'll look at how we use it in the training loop. We're first going to create a summary writer instance, and we're gonna call it TB for TensorBoard. Then we create an instance of our network. After we have our network, we need to get some images and labels. So we grab a batch from our train loader and we unpack it into two variables, an images tensor and a labels tensor. Then we're gonna use the make grid utility function that lives inside Torch Vision to create a grid of images that we'll ultimately see inside TensorBoard. We're gonna pass this grid to the summary writer. So what we do is we call on our summary writer object, TB, we say tb.addImage. We pass what is called a tag and the data. So we're saying images and then we're passing in the grid of images. There's a hundred images that have come from our batch and then they've been transformed into a grid. We're gonna see these in TensorBoard now. Next, we say tb.addGraph. We pass our network and the images tensor. And as a result of this call, we'll be able to see a graph or a visualization of our network inside TensorBoard. Now, lastly, we need to close the summary writer. So we call tb.close. So let's run this really quickly and then check out what happens inside TensorBoard. The grid of images and the network were both written to the file system. So let's go take a look at what this looks like. Okay, I'm here back in my terminal. And if we just do ls on the runs directory, now we can see that we have a folder here. And inside that folder, if we just do ls on runs in this folder, we can see that we have a file that has the data that we want to be displayed inside TensorBoard. So now we're ready to run TensorBoard. So let's just go ahead and run TensorBoard again. We'll say TensorBoard dash dash logger runs. Now TensorBoard is up and running on the localhost listening at port 6006. So we get back in our web browser and we can just see here that now, well it already refreshed, but basically before we had nothing to show now we have our images here. This is the batch that we passed in, the grid. And then we also have a graphs tab. So here, this graph is of our network. So if we just double click, we can actually get a visualization here of our network. And we can see that we have one conf layer, another conf layer, and then three linear layers. Now this isn't necessarily the most interesting thing in the world, but it is here. And so go ahead and check it out and dig in. You can kind of double click on some of these things and get some more information. But since we built this network, we know what this network is like. There's really no need for us to dig in and do any additional analysis. This is just getting us going with TensorBoard. What we really wanna see is data that we collect or emit from our training process. So let's go see how to do that now. 
Let's go over the training process really quickly, and then we'll be able to better understand where we need to put the tensor board calls in order to get data out of our training process. So we get an instance of our network, then we get a data loader, then we define our optimizer. If you're not familiar with these things, be sure to check the previous videos in the series. What comes next is the loop of epochs. So we say for epoch in some range. Right now we have the range defined as one, so we're only gonna do a single epoch in this particular loop. Once we get into the epoch, we're going to track the total loss and the total correct predictions as we iterate over all the batches within this epoch. So we define variables here, initialized at zero. Then, for each batch, we follow these steps. One, we procure a batch from the data loader. Two, we unpack this batch into an images tensor and a labels tensor. Three, we pass the images tensor to the network. Four, we take the predictions tensor along with the labels tensor and pass these two to the cross entropy loss function. Five, once the loss tensor is obtained, we zero our gradients using the optimizer. Then, we call the backward method on the loss tensor. Six, this is the point when everything is ready. We ask the optimizer to step in the direction of the loss function's minimum. To do this, the optimizer updates the network's weights using the gradients and the learning rate. Now, we have a network that is smarter than before. Okay, so once we've updated the weights, we take our loss and we track it, and then we also get our number of correct predictions, and we track that as well. We do this for every single batch, and then we print the statistics for each epoch. We have a total number correct of 46,434 and a loss value of 357. So that's a review of the training process. Now let's see how we can add in calls to TensorBoard to get this data out of our training loop and into TensorBoard. All right, so here's our new training loop with TensorBoard calls added. So let's just go over where these calls are added. The first calls are what we already saw before. We get the images and labels tensors and we create a grid and then we pass in the grid and the images. This is the part that we've already done, but we basically create our summary rider instance, call it TB for TensorBoard, and then we're ready to make the calls to add the data. So we add an image and then we add a graph. Then we begin our training loop. So everything in the training loop is exactly the same, except for down here, when we've completed a full pass over all batches in our training set, and we wanna take the statistics in. So down here where we used to just print the statistics, we're going to make some additional calls to the summary writer. So we're gonna call tb.addScaler, and a scalar is just a number, so we're just essentially adding a number. And then we're also going to call tb.addHistogram, which is a set of values that will be used to create a histogram. So let's look at the add scalar calls. We pass in three arguments to this call. We pass in what is called the tag, and that's just the name of the value. So we call add scalar, and then we say, for which one? For the loss. And so if we call that multiple times, then TensorBoard will know to group that data together. So we say we want to add a scalar with a, val with a tag of loss, then we pass the actual value, total loss, and then we pass the epoch for which this is occurring. And we do that for loss, number correct, and accuracy, all three of those. So this is going to allow us to visualize all three of those across all of our epochs. Next, we call add histogram, and then for this, we can pass sets of values our conf1 bias tensor, our conf1 weight tensor, and then we're gonna pass our conf1 weight gradient tensor. So these are also tags, so we name them out conf1.bias, conf1.weight, conf1.weight.grad. Those are the tags, and then we also pass the values, which is just network.conf1.bias, and so on. And we also pass the epoch. So that's all there is to it to actually get this data out of our training loop and up into TensorBoard. Let's go ahead and run this training loop and then see how this data looks in TensorBoard. All right, so our training process has completed for these 10 epochs. Let's flip over to TensorBoard and see how this looks. All right, we're here in TensorBoard and I'm going to just refresh. 
And now what you can see is before we only had images and graphs tabs at the top. Now we have scalars, distributions, and histograms. So let's take a quick look at the scalars. Each of these, by the way, correspond to the calls that we are making, add scalar, add images, add graph, and add histogram. So we can see here that we have tabs for the accuracy, loss, and number correct. These are the tags that we sent in to the calls that we made. So for the accuracy, we have that graphed, the loss, and number of correct. And if we just filter, we can say dot, and it will display another tab here that has for all scalars that match this search. So we can see that our accuracy went up and then our loss went down and our number of correct went up. And also we can hover over this and we can see the name of the run, more on this in just a second, that's super important. And then we can see the value and the step. So the steps are the epochs and as we move, we can see each value and the corresponding step. All right, so let's go take a look at the histograms now. Now for the histograms, this is where we passed in our conf1 bias tensor, our conf1 weight tensor, and our conf1 weight grad tensor. And then we can see each of these over time here. So at the back, that's the first time step or the first epoch. And then as we move forward, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this is showing us the frequency of occurrences for values inside of our bias tensor. Same thing for the weights here. We can start at the back, which is the first epoch, and we can move forward. And same thing for the gradients. And we can also see the distributions of each one of these graphs. Now, the distributions come along with the calls to add histograms. So if we add a histogram, we also get distribution data. Now, let's hop right back over here to the scalars, and I want you to just notice these two runs right here. So we have runs and we can search through all of the runs by writing a filter. And this is what we're going to talk about in the next video, because this is the real where the real power of TensorBoard comes in. The ability to make multiple runs and then compare them side by side, because when we have additional runs here and we check and uncheck them, we will see that those runs show come on and come off of the graph. And so we can compare and see like which run had the best accuracy. That's going to be the topic of the next video. It is helpful to see the loss and accuracy values over time. However, we might need to admit to ourselves that TensorBoard isn't really needed for this. We could just as easily done this inside of Jupyter Notebook. The real power of TensorBoard is its out of the box capability of comparing multiple runs. This allows us to rapidly experiment by varying our parameter values between runs and then comparing the outcomes to see which parameter values are working best. In the next episode, when we cover hyperparameter experimentation, we'll see how this is done. For now, we should have a good understanding of what TensorBoard is and how we can use it with PyTorch. If you haven't already, be sure to check out deeplizard.com where there's blog posts for each episode. There's even quizzes now that you can use to test your understanding of the content. And don't forget about the Deep Lizard Hive Mind, where you can get exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you in the next one. I want to talk to you about hill climbing and valley crossing. These two concepts represent two types of intelligence. The first is concerned with reaching a goal. This is like the idea of optimization. The second is concerned with deciding what the goal should be. It's like finding the most meaningful goals. These ideas correspond to the concepts of problem solving and creativity. As humans, it's important to realize that being intelligent is about more than just problem solving and optimization of some pre-existing goal. We must realize that being intelligent is also about finding the most meaningful goals. Can you think of examples of goals from these two categories? Look for hills and valleys, and put your examples in the comments. I'll see you in the valley beyond.